What up? What up? What's up, handsome? This may be the first time that you are the first one at hey. a meeting. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Listen, well, now I live no, down I love block you. from what? From the, yeah, said, you said what? Now I live down the block from that Verona park that we, that we work at. Oh, really? I'm what off of a. Uh, now. I'm going to be there before you. If we ever get back outside. Right, 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 right. I'm just going to. Oh, go boy. Those scissor things. AJ. Anyway, so how exactly did we, how exactly did you link up with Rachel? Um, well, my, what's up, June? My uh, old teammate of mine, I guess, made a connect with her at the coaches convention a few years back. Oh, we lit. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's so stupid. I love it. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm just hoping that she pops in because I didn't hear back from her today. Otherwise, we'll have to try and reschedule it or something. I hope so. Otherwise, hope so. just rescheduling it. You look like a condom. Oh, look at Ashley. Ooh. It's like a little condom when you put your when you put your hood on, bro. Huh? Said <laughs> you look like a condom when you put your hood on. Oh, this, I know, that's what I was going for, but I didn't want to interrupt Craig, he was talking. So when I was shaving. Here, guys. Huh? I brushed it, like, I look like, you know. All right, here she is, I'm gonna put her in. You guys quit fooling around. Ooh. All right, Jack, no joking around anymore. Accordingly. Act accordingly, Jack. <laughs> I hear my two-year-old just started screaming. Yank. Great. She's a Yankee. I don't know if I can do that. Come. Hey, uh, hey, Rachel. You guys, I'm so sorry. I had another another Zoom call before this run over, and I, I hate that I'm late to this. What's going on? No, no, no worries. My coaches are always late, so you're on time. <laughs> uh, wow. John Wooden. Slightly. Five minutes early is ten minutes late. Yes, I know. So that's the old wooden. That's the old wooden saying. If you're on time. You're late. If you're early. You're on time. And better late uh, than never. That's exactly right. Oh, look at Mike oh, with the money pick. Okay. I love it. He always does that. <sighs> What's up, Rachel? These are my coaches. I'm sorry, guys. God. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you guys? Awesome. Can't complain. <laughs> awesome, 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 awesome. Great to be chatting with Craig, you. Craig, why don't you introduce everybody? Yeah, why don't I? That's a good idea. That, that man there speaking is Jack Smithlin. He, uh, he's one of the mentors of the area. He's been doing this for about 700 years. So <laughs> he loves hitting. He studies it every single day. He's uh, one of the guys I worked hand in hand with for the last 10 or so years. Really love the guy. He's really good with what he does. Very passionate. Uh, junior JJ over there. He's one of my coaches. Oh, yeah. He works for our catchers and whatnot. So I'm, I'm sure you guys can click a little bit on that area. Uh, he's very versatile. He was an uh, all around player, played all positions, played a little independent ball in his career. Uh, we'll jump over to the guy Trevor with the cowboy hat. He's our comedian. He. Uh, <laughs> Never a dull moment around that guy. He played, what is it, 11 seasons? 11 years. For like 15 different teams in indie ball. <laughs> Didn't like to get too comfortable anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> he was uh, the all-star pitcher, as you would, he would like to put it. He was a, a versatile pitcher, you know, bounced around a little bit. He had a good changeup, I'll give him that. Anyway, Coach Ashley, he's our phenom. She's uh, head coach at Cushing softball right now and uh she's an up-and-comer she's she's our youngest she's our puppy we're trying to mold her and get her, get her the right way. No trouble hearing she's the baby just... mike put your windows up you mean jack 
Is it if Mike's windows are up, then yeah, it's Jack because he's outside. Because I know she can't hear because I can't hear either. Gotcha. Okay. Because of Jack. Wait, wait. Jack, don't make noise during my introduction. <laughs> I didn't say a word. <laughs> Just go inside and sit down, Jack. This is only I'm going. Feet. I'm trying. I'm walking. <laughs> As I was saying, Jack, Ashley's uh, co head coach at Jersey City University for softball. She's a Hall of Famer from the Dominican College, right? Mm -hmm. Got that right. Good job. And she's absolutely outstanding with all of our uh, young athletes. And there's Mike Ercolano who jumped in. Oh, yeah. I see him over there. He, he uh, has a fitness uh, facility in Randolph, New Jersey, I believe it is. He's that's been doing correct. that for quite some time. Scra yeah, that's what it is. That's what I said. Yeah. He, uh, Played college ball. I actually coached him at Montclair State University. He was also a catcher. Very good as well. Uh, he does a very good job as far as conditioning and strength training and all that stuff goes. I know that's one of your specialties as well, Rachel. And me, I'm, I'm just the old guy in the group outside of Jack. I uh, started my facility, um, Baseball's Finest, in New Jersey back in November of 18 after coaching in college ball for 13 years. And I played a little professional ball, an indie ball with that guy Trevor over there I was fortunate to win about three championships in the five years I played. Got hurt, and here I am. Stud alert. Now on to the now on to the star, Rachel. Tell us a little bit. We all kind of know who you are, where you're from, you know what you've done to get there. But how did you get so involved in coaching baseball? If I might ask. Oh gosh. Um, first of all, let me know if my is if I'm am I coming through clear? Because you're breaking up just a little bit there. You're good. Okay. Um, sometimes you know I'll be talking and I I cut out for five minutes. You know how that goes. Um, I mean I can go. I'm gonna make it real short and then sure. you can ask me what you'd like to to hear going forward from there. But I'm also. I'm, I'm, I think maybe someone's not on mute because I'm still getting a lot of noise. Is that if, if you guys? Hi, Jack. Okay? Nope, yeah, I'm not. I recommend is mute everybody. Yes, if you're not talking, I'm mute everyone. Hold on, I'm doing it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I just want to make sure that it's clear for you guys. But if there's noise on my end, that's fine. Um, so. You asked, like, how did I get into baseball? I, I like to say that's like the, lo the longest story ever, but I'll make it as short as I possibly can. Um, basically, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and I, play I grew up playing softball. So people are like, oh, are you a big baseball fan? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> I never really watched baseball that much growing up. I was obsessed with Texas softball and Jessica Mendoza and Kat Osterman and Jenny Finch and uh, those women. and um, played softball in college. So I went to Creighton University my freshman year and then transferred, went to New Mexico. From there, um, I did an internship at Athletes Performance and I did a graduate assistantship at LSU in Baton Rouge. I did a small internship at Arizona State. I did an internship with the St. Louis Cardinals. Then I did an internship in the Dominican Republic for Los Tigres de Lice, which is a winter ball team down there. So I was there for three months. Um, then I came back to the States. I had to sit a year out of baseball. I was heavily discriminated against. I can go back to that if you want me to. Um, and then I did another internship for Arizona State. So I did two unpaid internships for Arizona State. And then I did an internship for the Chicago White Sox. And then I was hired full-time by the St. Louis Cardinals after doing my internship with them. I was their minor league strength and conditioning coordinator for two years. And then I went on and uh, worked for the Astros for three years as a Latin American coordinator for two years and a double A strength coach for one year. And then I quit that, went back to school, moved to Europe. So I was in the Netherlands for a year and doing my coursework. And then I moved to Seattle to do my research at driveline baseball. And then the Yankees hired me as a minor league hitting coach. And here we are. <laughs> Very well done. That's a long journey you've had, which is awesome. Rachel, yeah. <clears throat> so you never, yeah. so you have yet, so you never coached softball. Uh, I coached went right into baseball or no was there yeah, I basically more or less went right into baseball but I coached a little bit of softball in the Netherlands so when I was in the Netherlands doing my uh, master's degree last year I kind of transitioned out of strength and conditioning and into the cages and so I was working with their 
national baseball and softball program. So I was working with their junior national softball team. But yeah, I mean, I've really coached mostly men my entire career, which people ask me like, what's the difference between coaching men and women? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't coached a lot of women. So e egos. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah that... <laughs> maybe sometimes. But I wouldn't know because I've only coached a, a handful of women in my career, really. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question for you from one of my young athletes, which is a pretty cool question. She said, hi, Rachel. My name is Alyssa Ricca. She plays softball. You know them, right? She goes, uh, it always annoyed me that there are no women playing in the major leagues and no major league softball teams. Maybe your lead will change things. I have read your bio and it was very impressive. Thank you. What was the hardest challenge entering a male dominated career and do they respect you now or are there still doubters? Um, okay, there are still doubters, but they sit behind their keyboards at home. So I don't, I always say like people are like, what, you know, they're like, well, how do you deal with people like being mean to you or whatever. I'm like, well, I, I usually don't have to deal with that because they will never say it to my face. So that's pretty easy. I don't have to deal with that very much. Um, or if they do, they do it on Twitter and it's pretty easy to ignore. But what I would say is like, I get asked this question so much and getting into baseball, like why, you know, can you repeat the exact wording so I make sure I get this right? Yeah, sure. It was, what was the hardest challenge entering a male dominated yeah. career? And do okay, you respect that? Yeah. I like I, this is something that was put in me when I was 12, you know, so it's hard to I I love coaching professionals and I do a fair bit of it and I offer one on one coaching. But the first step is really developing a really strong sense of confidence, you know, and being able to understand your purpose. And so, well, how do you develop confidence and understand your purpose? And why is that so important? It's it's like developing confidence started when I was 12 and I was a catcher and I was having to call out the outs, you know, when I was a young girl. And it started with my parents encouraging me to do things. And it started with my coaches when I was in high school, uh, really empowering me as a young woman. And, and that's a very intangible um, phrase. So I'm going to empower you, you know, what does that really mean? So I'll give you an example. Like, when I was in high school, I remember, like, I was a little coach, you know, so after the game, the coaches would give a post game talk, if we lost, had, had a tough loss, and then they would leave, and I would be like, everyone stay, and then I gave my post game talk to the team, and, and my coaches just let me, you know, they just let me be this really outspoken leader as a young woman, and they fostered that, and they never told me to stop, and they never told me to pipe down, you know, and so they really set me up for success, so I kind of like to say, you know, by the time that I was discriminated against it was too late for anyone to tell me that I couldn't do it you know so I was like oh okay you you're not going to hire me but somebody out there is going to hire me so I just had this kind of unwavering belief in myself um which starts that's you have to practice that you know you have to practice coaching and and having meaningful conversations about tough topics with people you have to practice that along the way I was fortunate enough to to get that as a young person but I do think you can still develop it you know in your professional career which is what I try to help people with now. And then the second part of that is just like having a purpose. So your purpose is not to help people hit a ball harder. It's not your purpose. Your purpose is not to make an elite level athlete. Your purpose is not even to help people. Like that's too broad. I like to say like your, your purpose is what, what is it in this world that only you can do based off of your experiences, your upbringing, your thought process, your athletic career, whatever, like what is it that only you can do? That is your job on this planet. Because there, there's somebody out there is curing cancer, thank God. Or somebody out there is developing right now a cure for COVID, thank God. That's not my purpose, but that's their purpose. And now it's like, that is something that only they can do because they've spent their entire life devoted to this. So what's my purpose? And I just think since I was, again, very young, I've had this really strong sense of confidence that I don't think a lot of young women have. So when I was discriminated against, this was 2013, I said I had gone to the Dominican and then I moved to Phoenix to start a PhD in nutrition, which I never ended up doing. But I, I said I'd already worked for the Cardinals, Arizona State, LSU, Exos, and I've lived in the Dominican. I spoke some Spanish. So anyone in baseball understands that's a pretty good resume for a young person in baseball. So I thought I would get a job 
fairly easily in Phoenix, being that there's so many teams based there. And I applied for about 10 of them and got nothing back. And I think to myself, there's probably a lot of women out there that have applied for those jobs. And when they got nothing back, they just quit, you know? Yeah. And so, or when they were discriminated against and they were told, well, we're not going to hire you because you're a woman, they just quit. And so I know who I am and I know the confidence that I have, I know the purpose that's strong within me. And I knew that if I didn't do it, there was a chance that it wasn't, I mean, I, I know that it would happen, but it's like, how much longer is it going to take? If I don't do this job that's specific to me, that's my purpose on this planet, how much longer is it going to take for somebody else with the same confidence level and experiences and playing experience and internships and the level of preparedness that I have to do the same job? Like when's the next time that's going to come around? So it's my job to stick this out for myself, but also for other women so that hopefully other women can have opportunities as a result of the fact that I lived my values and I stuck to my purpose and I kept going and I was able to be hired. So that was a long way of answering your question. I was just saying like, how did I get into a male dominated? How did that come about? Well, I can tell you, yeah, I applied for a job and I got the job, but that's not how it happened. It's like, this is, this is a long time of, of habits over a long period of time in being confident, walking into a room, being confident, talking to men and, and maybe men that are in an authority position, mm -hmm. um, being confident coaching and, and having tough conversations with people when they got to do something better, they got to do something they don't like. That's a, that's a long standing habit that I've had for a really long time before I was able to just get a job in a male dominated industry like that. Yeah, it's definitely a never give up mentality and just keep pushing no matter how many doubters you have or whatever. I mean, yeah, I've been down the road of applying for college jobs up and down. I mean, 20 to 25 applications I was sending in a, a, a each year, you know, and it was just, you know, and then, you know, it's a matter of keeping your kids close to your family and we couldn't move too far as the kids started to grow. So it kind of limited my my options and, and then started this new journey with the amazing team that I do have. And, you know, it was great seeing Coach Ashley jumping on at Jersey City University getting the head coaching job, which she still teases me a little bit about that she got a job and I didn't. But it's it's cool to see all those all those things really happen good for, for other people and the way they're supposed to happen because she's she's a horse too. She never gives up on anything and she portrays that in her teachings with all of our kids and, and she's really excellent with them. Um, I guess a follow up on that, like, would you say there was a defining moment or like, did you have a mentor or somebody that you really took to that you really followed a path as you were growing in your coaching career? I mean, I know you did strength and conditioning. I know you did a bunch of different things, bounced around and, and had a heck of a journey. But was there not, not necessarily one person or one defining moment, but I'm, I'm sure there's something in there that you could remember. Maybe it was not getting a job and saying, well, to heck with these doubters, I'm going to prove them all wrong. Was there was there a day or a moment or a coach or somebody who inspired you a little extra than everybody else? I don't want to, I don't want to discredit anyone because I've had phenomenal mentors in a lot of ways, but I would say that this is one area where I was really alone and I didn't really have a mentor in that specific situation because no one, no one had ever done it. And I don't really remember anyone saying that I could do it. Like, not my family, not my mm -hmm. boyfriend, not my friends, not anyone. And there are people who said, oh, okay, well, that's going to be tough, but, you know, try it. But no one that was like, fuck, yeah, like, go, mm -hmm. you know, go after that. So I was pretty alone. It was a really lonely time, I would say. But the, some defining moments of just, like, things that I remember. 2013 was, like, the year, year and a half of just growth, I guess you could say. But... So I had moved to Phoenix. I told you I applied for 10 jobs and I didn't even hear, hear like crickets, like nothing, just no response. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird, but I, I was really naive at the time. And I got a phone call finally midway through spring train, training and I already picked up a waitressing job. So I was waitressing, got a call midway through spring training. And the guy said, you know, one of our guys quit. Basically they were desperate and they were like, are you still local? Are you interested in this job? And I was like, yeah, of course. So I interviewed a couple of times and then uh, he said, you know, you're the girl, we were going to hire you. Look, give me just a couple of days. I'll get back to you uh, with some paperwork. And then I never heard from him. And I was like, still just so naive. I was like, that's weird. And so I, I didn't understand what was going on. So three weeks later, he calls me and he said, you know, I wanted to be honest with you. I, I 
you know, I thought we were going to be able to hire you, but we can't hire you. And it is because of your gender, which was surprising because that's illegal. <laughs> but also, yeah. also just like, um, I couldn't believe he told me and I, but I was so thankful. It was a defining moment because I was so thankful that he told, was honest with me and he was apologizing and he's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I feel horrible. My mother's a PhD. I support women. I, I, you are the best candidate by far. Like your resume is ridiculous. Like he's, he was telling me things I didn't understand because I was getting no responses. And like, I just thought, oh, I have to work harder or I have to have more internships than I already had, which was like six. And I had done all these things. And he was like, your resume is by far the best. You are the best candidate. He was like, I want to tell you these things. So you know that you're doing the right things, but also so you know what you're up against. And I was like, well, you know, thank you. And he was like, well, uh, it gets worse. And I thought, well, how could this possibly get worse? Because you just told me you discriminated against me. And he was like, well, I, I took so long to get back to you because I called around to all these other teams that I was checking to see if, you know, I knew they had open positions. I was checking to see if they had an open position for you. And they all said that they had also received your resume and also could not entertain the idea of hiring you because you're a woman. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is not just one team. This is many teams that hold this belief. And this is after, by the way, I had already done an internship for the St. Louis Cardinals. So I was very naive to think, like, I'd already worked in professional baseball a little bit, you know, and then I moved to Dominican Republic. I spoke some Spanish, LSU, Arizona. I had all these great things. I was pretty naive at the time, not understanding that just because I had worked for one organization that, oh, everyone's on board with that now. So that was a defining moment that I knew I had to, like, make a decision of I'm really going to put my head down here or I'm going to have to do something else and just do the normal route, go find a college job, which I was getting contacted nonstop about college strength and conditioning jobs. So I could have easily done that. Um, but I just, that was a defining moment of like, Nope, I'm going to choose the hard, you know, I'm going to choose the difficult route. So I set out that year, continued to waitress. I did an internship at Arizona State again. So I had already kind of done a short internship there and I went back and I just told them the situation and they let me basically come in for a few hours in the morning, work with baseball and softball in the morning there. And then I would go and do my waitressing job. And then the next defining moment I would say, is like next year coming around, the whole season goes by, off season comes around. And I started applying again, but I, I changed my name on my resume, which has gained, that story has gained quite a bit of popularity. So um, I changed my name on my resume and I got immediate responses, which that in itself was a defining moment because it was just this, it was like this strange dichotomy of the situation where I'm having this really disheartening situation, getting discriminated against. But also when that guy called me and told me I was being blatantly, I was like, oh, okay. So my resume is great. You're saying that all the work I'm doing is paying off. People are noticing my resume. They, they saw my resume. They noticed it. They know exactly who I am, but they're still seeing them. So it's just my gender, which sounds silly. Oh, it's just my gender. Like, that's easy, nothing. But at least I knew the hard work I was doing was paying off behind the scenes, even if it wasn't giving me the result that I actually wanted, which was getting the job. And so I was presenting myself correctly, which is half the battle. It's like, I, I kind of listen. I do like one-on-one -on -one professional coaching and I do coaching for young professionals and I have a course on this, but part of that learning process was like, I need to be so good at presenting myself through my resume and my cover letter and my email that I'm sending because I have just to get a look at this is like, I have to be so good at that. So part of that was changing my name to present myself virtually differently. And I got responses right away. Uh, that was pretty short lived because it got real awkward real fast. Uh, I got a bunch of emails back saying like, they think, you know, we'd like to interview you. I was setting up phone interviews and then I got a phone call one day and I answered, I didn't know who it was. And they said, Hey, uh, I'm looking for Ray. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I never got, I was like, Oh, I was like, Oh, it worked. And I, I was like, Oh, this is she, you know? And, and he was like, uh, there's just like the awkward, you know, moment on the other end of the line and I was like oh my god this is so horrible and ended up where I, I couldn't talk at the time I said hey can we talk tomorrow and I never heard from him and so it got real awkward and as I was corresponding with people through email as Ray I started responding as Rachel and then they stopped responding so it, it just it it was pretty short-lived alter ego and it didn't actually help me get a job in the end but it did help me you know 
understand again, okay, like my resume is good. I just wasn't getting responses because of my gender. So it, it gave me like some fuel to keep building this resume so that eventually they couldn't deny me. And so I went through that whole off season pretty much. I mean, again, if you're in the baseball world, you know, like by January, all the jobs are filled. So it was like Christmas time and I hadn't gotten a job yet. And finally I get a phone call from the major league strength coach from the Cardinals. It's like another moment I will never forget. This name popped up and I thought, why is this guy calling me? Cause I worked for the Cardinals two seasons before. I, I answered the phone and he goes, Hey, Rachel, uh, this is Pete. I just want to know if you're interested in the interviewing for the minor league strength and conditioning coordinator job. And I pulled the phone away from my face. I'll never forget. I like looked at the phone. I was like, is someone messing with me? Like who? I'm like, this is not real. Cause I couldn't even get like a low paid seasonal internship at this point. And here this guy from the Cardinals wants me to oversee 10 male strength and conditioning coaches and 250 athletes and assist with all of the major league operations as well and travel all over the country doing this. And I'm like, is he joke? Is this a joke? Like, I don't understand this. I couldn't even get an internship and here I am getting a huge managerial position. So the rest is history. I interviewed and got that job and was hired full time. And that was a, a fun, it was a fun time of like, you know, people reaching out that I knew had like discriminated against me and they're reaching out to like congratulate me. And I'm like, do you understand how this is like a little weird, right? <laughs> so I had like applied for jobs that I knew that they had discriminated against me. And now they're like, hey, it's so great to see you get hired. And I'm like, really? Okay, I think that's good. So that was a really, that whole year was a defining moment. You know, that, that year of like just understanding I had to make the decision to, like, I mean, I was so convinced that I was going to sit out that year that I had already applied and been accepted to an internship at Cressy's place in Boston. So I was like, I was already, I was literally a week away from moving to Boston to start an internship with Cressy and got the call from the, the Cardinals. So it was a tough time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. A lot of sacrifice in there. You hear that, Trevor? Take sacrifice to achieve your goals, buddy. <laughs> yeah, explain it to me. <laughs> yeah, right? Any um, any coaches have any uh, questions you want to ask? I know Jack's probably itching to say something over here, but he's been muted for a while. Jack, you still with us, buddy? I don't even know if he knows how to unmute himself. <laughs> anyway, Trevor, you got any questions? You're always uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of more of a current. So I get Jack in here. I, absolutely, I got one. So kind of current event. Um, so you know, your your story is absolutely one of perseverance and you know, reality that you kind of broke a lot of barriers, uh, hopefully changed a lot of people's minds. So, and inspired a lot of people. So going into your current job now with the Yankees, how are you going to translate that into communicating with some of uh, those gentlemen, uh, you know, big egos, small egos, medium egos, because, you know, in the big leagues, it, there's definitely a lot of those stories of perseverance. And then there's a lot of those stories of, you know, studs are studs, studs kind of get what studs get. But then all those middle to lower end guys who have really given everything just to get that cup of tea in the bigs, that one season. So how are you planning on, or are you uh, translating some of that inspiration and knowledge onto them? Um, I mean, I don't, the players are, easier than they seem I think um I if I ever have like and, and this is consistent for almost every woman that I talk to that like works in sports or works in a male-dominant industry or whatever it's like the players are rarely the problem the problem is usually colleagues or like the you know the Twitterverse you know or people who are who don't who aren't in it but if if you like if I work it with or around a player for more than five minutes they're gonna have a fucking clue what I'm about so it's like, it, it just, there's definitely like some curiosity and some ego or whatever, maybe at first, but that falls away so fast when they, under, they see me work and they see my work ethic, they see my passion. They, I, I might add like the things that I think I see them light up or that it starts a conversation is when I might be like, Oh, so do you like, do you struggle with the outside pitch or whatever? And they're like, yeah, I do. Kind of like, how do you know that? I'm like, Oh, I actually know what I'm doing. So that I think just like having conversation with them kind of lightens that 
pretty immediately, especially if we're able to make an adjustment and they, like build that trust. I, I think like coaching is coaching. It's, it's so simple. If they know that you care, they know that you can help them. They know that you work hard. They see how you carry yourself as a person, which is part of like, or going back earlier to that confidence. Like when I walk into a room, I'm not like, you know, looking around, like I'm lost. Like I fucking walk into the room and it's, it's like, you don't, we, we as humans have such an intuitive natural sense about those things. And, and we see it on a, on a grand scale. If you were to see somebody on the street with their hood up and their head down when their hands in their pockets, you're probably going to switch sides of the street. <laughs> like if they're walking like this and it's a bright summer day and you can't see their face, you're kind of just like, you keep one eye on that person to be like, Hey, what's going on with that person? You know? So it's, it's no different. We can tell, you can intuitively tell when someone walks up to you and is looking you in the eye and speaking confidently about what they're saying, like we, we believe them. So I think translating that to the players is, and, and relating to them as a coach is easier than it seems. And especially because the heart, the hardest part kind of touched on what you talked about Trevor is like, I relate to these guys so much more than they understand until they get to know my story. You know, because obviously you're an indie ball warrior and there's a few indie ball warriors on here. Like you move around, you sleep on couches, you're broke, you eat, eat like you're poor, you, you lose, you lose friends, you, your relationships suffer, you move, you know, those are all things that I can really deeply personally relate to moving all the time, you know, losing friendships, struggling with, with being poor and broke and giving up my life savings at the age of 30 to go back to school in Europe. That wasn't easy living in a foreign country. Like there are so many things that I can relate to as a person, but they, pro they don't see that right away. Cause they, you clearly can see that I'm different. Like the, the one thing that's very obvious is that I'm different, but I think once they get to know me, they understand that like a lot of my struggles, they can probably relate to. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. I do. Can, can, can I say one thing real quick? Um, Jack's going to go next. <laughs> He's you texting know, over you. <laughs> Rachel, I love everything that you're saying. And, um, you know, like I always, I think when, like, for example, like I love the team, right, that we have. And then first meeting Craig, just, um, you know, he and I always talk about this. I think at the end of the day, when you just simplify things, like people are people, right? And like for myself, this is my second year coaching um, collegiate softball. And I was a big baseball guy and I got involved in softball through, you know, a couple of coworkers in the past, but, you know, I was the youngest coach, I think, in the conference. Um, so that was something to deal with, like coaching, you know, collegiate girls who think that I'm only like three years older than them. And then I'm like, hey, we have, you know, respect, you know, just building respect. Um, also gaining respect from other coaches in the league in terms of just work ethic and what you put in. But I love a couple of things that you touched on, um, you know, just making people understand that there's like a, a like a, you know, bright light at the end of the tunnel. And I had one coach that I think we got into a big disagreement this year. You know, he was telling the ladies like, you know, this, this may be it for you after salt, like after this year. And I'm like, no, you know, and I think that like what you talk about with encouragement, like someone like yourself, I told ladies, this is not it, you know, whether it's softball, anything you want to do doesn't mean, yeah, you might, be done playing because if that's you know what it is for you but you're not like you can it's so much more I think now especially for women like um like Jessica Mendoza for example like well she's killing it with MLB and being on MLB network and uh, ESPN and stuff like that so my question to you is because I everything that you're saying I agree with you 110 percent what would you say to like younger uh you know females who feel like they have certain coaches who discourage them like hey you know, after this, this may be it. Like, what would your words of encouragement be? Oh, I, I just, I love to see women or men, you know, like using their careers as their purpose and using what they've learned because it's like you, I don't think it's talked about enough where like being a college athlete is so, such a valuable experience. And that's, it's more rare than you think because you live inside the world of college athletics yeah. And you're like, oh, this is how the world is. And then you get out into like the real world and you're like, why are you not hustling? <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're like, yeah. what's wrong with you? Like, how are you, how, what, what do you mean you're busy? Like, this is not busy. So like using those skills that they develop as athletes, 
getting into, I, I, I would love to see young women having opportunities for careers at a high level of sport, whatever that means. If they want to coach in softball, that's great. Like that wasn't my path, but that's a wonderful career path. But also just to know that they have an opportunity to coach also in baseball if they wanted to. Yeah. So I think just, I mean, I hope I'm living that value of, of displaying opportunity where they, they even if, I mean, it's, it's funny to me to hear a coach say, you know, and yeah, my, their playing career might be over, you know, unless they are at an extremely elite level and they can play at the national level and those kinds of things. But like your career in sports is not over, it, not by a long shot. So I hope that the noise of coaches or people saying like, you're done with softball at the end of your playing career is kind of funny now, isn't it? Like, yeah. oh, you, yeah. there's a, not just a coaching job that is going to not pay you very well, but like legitimate career track of coaching and making a great, you know, living for your family off of that and making a very successful career out of that for yourself. So you can impact a lot of people. That's a real thing. I think one of the things you touched on before that was really excellent and a simpler way, I guess, to say to our kids that we're training is, you know, of using the doubters as fuel, to, to do better and to prove everybody wrong as a motivation, as opposed to being like, Oh man, I don't know. It's going to be really hard. You say, well, the heck with it. If you don't think I could do it, watch this now watch me. Yep. And it's just yep. 10 times over, watch how big I can be. And then it's, you know, you don't even have to say anything at that point. You're at the level now where you just get to smile and turn around and look at them in your <laughs> rear view because they're not even in anywhere in sped anymore, which is, which is I think cool. funny. Cool. It's funny how it's changed now where like when I first was getting in like everyone anyone I said I wanted to work in professional baseball there's not one person that really had like a positive response but now when I say like I want to be a general manager there's not one person that doesn't have a positive response which is funny like it's funny there's there's no women that are general managers but it would be hilarious to be like oh you can't do that you're a woman like you can't tell me that anymore but that first part of like getting through that you know, proving it to other people was tough. And I'd be lying. Like people are like, Oh, do you, sometimes you feel like you're, you overdo it because you want to prove people wrong. And I, I mean, pr probably at first that only takes you so far. Like this is not so I can prove people wrong. Right. But when I was, when everyone was telling me I couldn't like, you bet your ass, I had a chip on my shoulder, you know, I was like, Oh, okay. Like, Oh, yeah. all right. All right. Yeah. I'll see you over there. You know, like I'd, I'd be lying, you know, like the more that people told me I couldn't, the more, I wanted to do it, you know, at first. Now, of course, again, that, that motivation only can take you so far. So that's not why I'm in coaching, but for sure, for sure. That was a part of it. Well, I'm going to unmute Jack here. Cause I, I bet he's itching to say something because he's been trying <laughs> to like get in here and I hear this Jack. whistling and sounds going, Jack, are you there, bud? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You have any questions for our friend Rachel over here? Well, don't first start of talking all, Rachel. That would be quiet. I'm not talking hitting. Well, let's talk. Let's talk the mental game because yes, she's going to have to deal with a lot of that. There's every every single one of those pro hitters has a different a, a different thought about what they're doing, and and that's going to be your that's going to be one of your toughest uh, things, Rach, is to deal with their personalities and their you know I I know the best, I know more, but I'm so proud of what you're doing. It's amazing. I mean, I'm one of the coaches that. You know, when kids are trying out for teams, and I do a lot of tryouts, I conduct a lot of tryouts at the at the youth level. I'm now coaching at Montclair State. I was their hitting coach this year, and I've coached for 44 years. And um, one of the things that 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 I agree with more than anything is that when a kid comes out and tries out, and there's that one girl in the group, and everybody says, "Ah, oh, what is she doing?" Which I said, just let her play. Let her let her be who she wants to be. For God's sakes, I mean, and, you know, and, and, and most of the time the girl shows up most of the boys. But, you know, I'm like Happy Gilmore. I mean, Happy Gilmore was a hockey player playing golf. You know, I'm a baseball person playing, coaching softball. And all my, uh, all my Hall of Fames are in softball and not in baseball. I had two sons that played baseball. One played with uh, Coach Conway there um, at the pro level. But. My question to you is what drew you, what drew, what did the Yankees see in you that they approached you? Um, so I worked with, uh, 
Dylan Lawson is the hitting coordinator for the New York Yankees right now, and he was with the Astros previously. So I worked with Dylan um, with the Astros as a strength and conditioning coach. And so when I was with the Astros, they, uh, their, I saw their hitting coaches in a really different way than I've ever seen any sport coaches really is like their hitting department, which was headed by Jeff Albert. Jeff Albert had a master's degree in kinesiology and a strength and conditioning background. And so he hired a lot of coaches that had a, a background in kinesiology or strength and conditioning that happened to be hitting coaches as well. So you'd walk in the weight room in the morning in spring training and the whole weight room is filled with all the hitting coaches getting after it, you know, like they're, they're like, they were driving um, physical performance for the Astros, like from the hitting department, they were asking us to do more, be more involved, understanding the mechanics of hitting more. And so I always had, I kind of like had this idea put in me that like they were masters of the body and just applied that to the skill of hitting. So myself, I, once I kind of got the bug, this is in my time with the Astros to leave strength and conditioning and go on to something else, which I thought at the time could be scouting or hitting possibly. I went back to school and I was in contact with Dylan who I'd be, I'd become friends with all the hitting coaches cause they were all me heads and they were all in the weight room all the time and teaching us. And I, and, and I would then go into their hitting meetings and I would, I, every chance I got, I was in hitting meetings, pitching meetings, scouting meetings, trying to learn a more holistic, like uh, view of the game. And so I was, you know, we were, we were fully integrated and they, I had great relationships with those guys and became friends with them. And then Dylan got the job with the Yankees as the hitting coordinator at the same time that I moved to Europe. So I went off to Europe and I was studying, but during that time I was deciding what to do my research in. And I had learned about eye tracking from the, from the Astros through Dylan and eye tracking is not something that's really taught a lot. It's very, it's a very, it's not new, but it's newer in baseball. Very, I think it's not talked about, talked about in many coaching circles. So I decided to do my research in eye tracking. Well, Dylan is one of the leading guys in the world in eye tracking in baseball, which no one knows because he keeps, he keeps his secret. So this is secret, top secret information. Not really, but so I moved to Seattle and did my research in eye tracking at driveline. And that's, I think, from a skill perspective, one of the things that attracted the Yankees to me. Um, but also just like Dylan saw me work for three years. You know, he knew who I was as a person, my work ethic, how I communicate with players, what kind of standards I held. And so that's not, that's something that doesn't go away once you become a hitting coach. You know, like those, those like intangibles of, of just coaching idealism don't go away when you become a hitting coach. Like for me, I know this is like crazy to the outside world, but I feel the same. Like I'm just a coach and now I'm coaching the body doing something different in a different place, but I'm still just coaching, you know? That's great. Hey Mike, I know we didn't get to you yet, but you want to jump in here so we can let Rachel get on her day. I'm sure she got a huge day planned ahead of her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, <clears throat> now I, I know you transitioned and I could probably turn this entire conversation into a strength and conditioning conversation because that's, you know, my whole world. So I'll try to keep it as basic and uh, I don't know, as um, relatable as possible. So, um, you know, you obviously started in the strength and conditioning world and transitioned um, into more, you know, skill work baseball wise. But when it comes to strength and conditioning and these higher level athletes, how much is dictated um, by the teams themselves versus how much they're doing on their own? Um, because, like, for example, obviously, um, like the Yankees have gone out and hired Cressy, which you, you mentioned before, um, to oversee their entire strength and conditioning program because of their injuries, all their injuries are going on. But I know in the off season, a lot of these guys are doing stuff on their own and not teamwork. So um, when it comes to a balance, how, how is there a balance or am I wrong with that? And the coaches are working with them all year round. This is why I'm not a strength coach anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I would say uh, it's, a, it's a conundrum. So players are going home, and especially Latin American players are going home sometimes with really little equipment. And so all off season long, we don't see them. And then, I mean, some guys do a great job, you know. And, and honestly, like, as a strength coach for – I was in baseball for seven seasons as a strength coach, and, like, if a guy comes back after an off season in great shape, I don't care what he did. You know, it doesn't have to be our program. If he has somebody that he trusted or just, 
I, I get it. You want to go and work out with a, a group of pro guys. Great. That, I, I get it. Like I, I would want to do that too. So I, I would be happy. The problem is, is of course, when they go somewhere and, and they come back and they're out of shape is a big problem, of course. Or when a lot of our Latin players go home and they don't have the same equipment that our American <laughs> players have when they go back and train at their colleges. So it, it's a big issue. You would like to think that with all the technology, we could keep better, you know, communication with them, better tabs on them. But also we're, that's dealing with a really macro level issue of like, there are no standards set by the organization when the player comes back. So a player could come back with 10% more body fat and he's still going to go through spring training. So, and that's not the strength, you know, it's like, that's not even kind of, it's not on the strength coach because the strength coach didn't set the standard all they want. But if they come back and they know it's not, it doesn't matter, they're still going to pitch in spring training, even if they're way out of shape, then there's the strength coach can preach all they want. So we're, we're looking at a macro level issue of like administration would need to step in and go, you know, you, I don't want to restrict players from going to train at other facilities because well, it's our job to sell. If they like our program enough, then they're going to do it. Number one, but number two, like, again, they, if you want to go train in a group setting, that's positive. You're going to be around other guys, you're competing. There's your, there's accountability, you know, so I'm not going to tell a player they can't go do that, but you bet when you come back, the organization has set these goals, A, B, and C for you to get stronger, to uh, lean out a little bit, to, get fat, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. If you come back and you haven't met those goals, you're not training in spring training, period. Which, which anyone who's been around any kind of professional baseball knows that is far from happening. So mm -hmm. basically like if you show up and you're a prospect, you could show up 20 pounds overweight and you're still going to participate in every activity, no matter what the strength coach said. So I think like to answer your question, you're pretty spot on with your, uh, uh, viewpoint on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I just follow up with that with a, a question um, in, in your opinion? And I think this probably will help uh, a lot of the, like a lot of our athletes that are watching, um, you know, I mean, from my experience and I haven't, I haven't had experience at the professional level like you have or, or a high collegiate level in terms of um, being a strength and conditioning coach. I've been in the, um, you know, the private sector my entire life. As soon as I graduated college, I, I opened my own gym. Um, but when it comes to, um, you know, training, whether it's a lower level athlete or a higher level athlete, um, I, I personally feel the higher level athletes are actually easier to train because it's, you know, it's just a couple of tweaks here or there. What would you say the most important things for our lower level and by lower level, I mean, um, age wise um, for them to focus on when it comes to training? Um, because I, I feel that there's a lot of BS out there when it comes to speed and agility and using stupid drills and ladder drills that I, I could go on forever about that. But what would you say the most important part to keep it simple for the younger athletes? What should they focus on um, in the off season and on the in season to prepare their body properly? Um, I don't believe in sports specific training unless you can like squat your body weight. I just, yep. I mean, I, I like, I, I made that up, but like I made up that, not that mark, you know, but like sports specific training isn't a thing until someone is like at a high level of, of athleticism. And that does not mean a high level of baseball. That means a high level of athleticism. So those Movement. two things are different. I've worked with a lot of elite level baseball players that are not strong, not athletic, like that could still use those foundational things. So I, I just, I'm definitely a product of, <laughs> What did you say? No, I, I think Trevor said pitchers. Pitchers. I'm a pitcher. It was a joke. Yes, yes. Yeah. Very unathletic. Yeah, that's, that's probably more, you know, I, I definitely know a lot of pitchers that, that weigh 185 pounds and throw 95 miles an hour. So, um, you know, but there's, there's something to be said for, like, I think sports-specific training at, at the lower level is the sport, you know, and also playing others. Like, if you want to get agilities – play soccer you know like play soccer for god's sake please 100 percent. play basketball play, uh, play football like make contact with other bodies be you know and that's that's so taboo these days especially football but it's like we have to make them robust athletes so that when we do specialize they're more resistant to the injury i, I think i'm probably preaching to the choir in this group but i'm just yeah i'm so that's so old the agility ladder for 10 year olds so old you know <laughs> don't forget we'll wrestling too well. What? I said, don't forget wrestling. Yeah. 
Oh, like we got wrestling. Like, oh, wrestling. Oh my God. Martial arts, gymnastics. Like, oh my God. Yeah. The, <laughs> whatever the most treacherous sport that you can put your kid in, the better. Like, honestly, that's it. Well, so I, I'm very, I mean, you know, I know you said preaching to the choir with that, but I, I, I'm glad you said what you said because I get to show this to some of our athletes. And you said exactly what we preach with every kid we work at play other sports train to be an athlete don't worry about training baseball movements sports specific you know we do a lot of stuff just training to be athletes learning where your feet are learning how to control your balance because as these kids grow and they go from 11 to 12 years old and they gain 30 pounds and sprout up four inches they don't have the coordination they had the year prior and whatnot and you know we're stuck in a in a realm of what gimmicks are selling best this week and use our hit tracks machine and try this out and and we just kind of roll our eyes at some of these people and parents are paying out of their, out of the wazoo just to get these kids into these, these crazy programs instead of these kids actually training. And, you know, there's some club baseball in New Jersey where parents are paying upwards of four to $5,000 for kids to play baseball for a spring and summer. And it's, it's just unheard of. I, I could never imagine. Yeah, doing that. And, and these kids are getting different coaches at each practice and different coaches at each game. And they never have a sense of consistency or any type of training that's helping them to evolve and develop in the proper way. And it's, it's a shame because it's a very money driven uh, sport in our area. And there's just tons and tons of people doing it for the wrong reasons. But I agree. I agree. And then can I just uh, chime in real quick? One question. Last one. Yeah. Last one. I know. I know. know. Um, If you had to, all right. In terms of uh, whether you want to answer for just overall being an athlete or for hitters, too, since I know, well, hitters, okay? If you had, like, just three things you want to share with a young hitter um, or that's your, like, go-to as, like, your pillars of just doesn't matter, you know, boy, girl, 25, whatever, the age limit, just three pillars of hitting. Like, what, what do you break down with every hit that's, like, pretty consistent for you or, like, things you believe in that they should just work on? And then we'll let you go. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. I just, I just lost all that. I didn't get any of that. So just real, all right, sorry. I'm just saying like three things that you believe in, doesn't matter, you know, athletic, you know, athletic wise or age or strength, whatever. Just three pillars of hitting for you that you believe in that's like just across the board, a foundation that hitters should work on or you believe in to teach. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, did we lose her? I don't know. I think so. No, you just have a shitty question. <laughs> Damn, you can ask a shitty question? <laughs> she just doesn't want to answer. Mike, don't be hating on my Rachel. question. <laughs> I didn't hate yeah, it. She's not the one answering. I did not hear a single thing Rachel. for like a minute. I think it's a great question. Can you hear him at all? Now I can see it was frozen on my end with you. No, I, I didn't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Just real simple, your three pillars. Hear me. Everybody's talking. You, that, oh, how about Rachel, now? You there? <laughs> oh, so Uh-oh. she left. Damn, shitty question Thank alert. You, Great job. Way to chase her away. Good job, Junior. You kicked her out. Junior. Oh, I get it. Man. I heard you. Blame question, me. Junior. Uh, Thank she's you, coming Trevor. back. Hold on. Can I, can I answer that? Last question. We gotta get her. We gotta get. Her. It's three o'clock. Back, back elbow up, eye on the ball, swing down as hard as you can. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, right, try I've, it again. Rachel, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Quick question: right. What are you gonna do with the fem retreat since we're quarantined right now? <laughs> oh, great question. Um, fem retreat. Female executive mentorships. Um, we are playing around with some online content. We'd still really love to have an event, but it's probably going to be 2021. So we're playing around with some online content. And uh, I mean, Ashley, actually, you're like perfect. I if, am. If you, if you I are. Um, this. That was like the first thing I said. That's why I was on 15 minutes early. I'm like, where'd she, is she? I'm just waiting here. <laughs> I still um, yeah, you could, you could shoot me uh, like an email or a message and like, give me like what you would want to hear because we were going to do the event and then now we're having to rethink and we're like maybe we should just do it online almost like webinar so we might even offer like a really either free or very inexpensive webinar for like three-day thing like what do you want to know from that one would just be myself and Jen Wiederstrom um the event was going to be other speakers as well 
So I, we're open to suggestions, but we're we're putting this, some things together right now. So, um, and I don't know if you like follow, if you follow the FEM account or whatever, then we're planning on reaching out to everyone through that or through my social media. So you'll see it okay. if and when right. we go. So good, Ash? Yeah, JJ, ask her. She can hear you clearly now. Last right, question, JJ. I heard you the first time. Sorry. So listen, just real quick. Um, I was just saying, it was a simple question of like baseball. So it doesn't matter. Just your three pillars of hitting that you like to teach across the board, like something very general on your belief. Uh, yeah. Hinge, rotate. Oh, three things, three pillars. Hinge and rotate, I'll say, uh, for the mechanical aspect. And then actually the first pillar would be eye tracking pitch recognition okay. so okay. i mean that's really broad but yeah i, I kind of have to keep it that broad because the yankees are the yankees will be upset if i give away secrets but gotcha, uh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. fair enough okay. we'll take it. Trash Appreciate can't it. Bang it thank you all right well rachel we'll let you get on your way thank you for jumping on with us yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, really Rachel. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And best of luck to you this year and the years to come. Congratulations on all your success. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good Bye, luck, guys. Rachel. Thank, Thank you so much. Take care. We'll see you soon. All right, everybody. I'll see you guys later. Craig, I love you so much. That was awesome. I love Ash all was, of you. Ash was, Ash was shooting that shot, boy. Boop, boop, boop. What? Absolutely. You'll find me in a picture holding her hand tomorrow.